my father always said, early to bed and early to rise makes a man healthy, wealthy and wise. It was lights out at 8 p.m. in our house and we were up at dawn to the smell of coffee, frying bacon and scrambled eggs. My father followed this general routine for a lifetime and died young, broke and I think not too wise. Taking note, I rejected his advice and it became for me late to bed and late to rise. Now, I'm not saying I've conquered the world, but I've avoided numberless early traffic jams, bypassed some common pitfalls and have met some strange, wonderful people. One of whom was myself. Someone my father never knew. Henry Charles Bukowski, born Heinrich Karl Bukowski, August 16th, 1920 to March 9th, 1994, was an American poet, novelist, and a short story writer. His writing was influenced by the social, cultural, and economic ambience of his adopted home city of Los Angeles. Bukowski's work addresses the ordinary lives of poor Americans, the act of writing, alcohol, relationships with women, and the drudgery of work. The FBI kept a file on him as a result of his column, Notes of a Dirty Old Man, in the LA underground newspaper, Open City. Bukowski published extensively in small literary magazines and with small presses beginning in the early 1940s and continuing on through the early 1990s. He wrote thousands of poems, hundreds of short stories and six novels, eventually publishing over 60 books during the course of his career. Some of these works include his poems written before jumping out of an eight-story window published by his friend and fellow poet Charles Potts, and better known works such as Burning in Water, Drowning in Flame. These poems and stories were later republished by John Martin's Black Sparrow Press, now HarperCollins Echo Press, as collected volumes of his work. As noted by one reviewer, Bukowski continued to be, thanks to his antics and deliberate clownish performances, the king of the underground and the epitome of the littles in the ensuing decades, stressing his loyalty to those small press editors who had first championed his work and consolidating his presence in new ventures such as the New York Quarterly, Chiron Review or Slipstream. In 1986, Time called Bukowski a laureate of American lowlife regarding his enduring popular appeal. Adam Kirsch of The New Yorker wrote, The secret of Bukowski's appeal is that he combines the confessional poet's promise of intimacy with the larger-than-life aplomb of a pulp fiction hero. During his lifetime, Bukowski received little attention from academic critics in the United States, but was better received in Europe, particularly in the UK and especially Germany, where he was born. Since his death in March 1994, Bukowski has been the subject of a number of critical articles and books about both his life and writings. His father was Heinrich Henry Bukowski, an American of German descent who had served in the US Army of Occupation after World War I and had remained in Germany after his army service. His mother was Katerina Neifet. Bukowski's father had an affair with Katerina, a German friend's sister, and she subsequently became pregnant. Bukowski repeatedly claimed to be born out of wedlock, but Andernach marital records indicate that his parents married one month before his birth. Bukowski's family moved to Mid-City Los Angeles in 1930. Bukowski's father was often unemployed. 
In the autobiographical Ham on Rye, Bukowski says that with his mother's acquiescence, his father was frequently abusive, both physically and mentally, beating his son for the smallest imagined offence. He later told an interviewer that his father beat him with a razor strop three times a week from the ages of six to 11 years. He says that it helped his writing as he came to understand undeserved pain. Young Bukowski spoke English with a strong German accent and was taunted by his childhood playmates with the epithet Heine, a German diminutive of Heinrich in his early youth. He was shy and socially withdrawn, a condition exacerbated during his teen years by an extreme case of acne. Neighbourhood children ridiculed his accent and the clothing his parents made him wear. The Great Depression bolstered his rage as he grew and gave him much of his voice and material for his writings. In his early teen years, Bukowski had an epiphany when he was introduced to alcohol by his friend William Baldy Mullinax, depicted as Eli Lacrosse in Ham on Rye, son of an alcoholic surgeon. This alcohol is going to help me for a very long time, he later wrote, describing a method, drinking, he could use to come to more amicable terms with his own life. After graduating from Los Angeles High School, Bukowski attended Los Angeles City College for two years, taking courses in art, journalism and literature before quitting at the start of World War II. He then moved to New York City to begin a career as a financially pinched blue-collar worker with hopes of becoming a writer. On July 22, 1944, with the war ongoing, Bukowski was arrested by FBI agents in Philadelphia where he lived at the time on suspicion of draft evasion. At a time when the US was at war with Nazi Germany and many Germans and German Americans on the home front were suspected of disloyalty, Bukowski's German birth troubled authorities. He was held for 17 days in Philadelphia's Moya Mensing prison. 16 days later, he failed a psychological examination that was part of his mandatory military entrance physical test and was given a selective service classification of 4F, unfit for military service. The birds. The acute and terrible air hangs with murder as summer birds mingle in the branches and warble and mystify the clamour of the mind. An old parrot who never talks sits thinking in a Chinese laundry, disgruntled, forsaken, celibate. There is red on his wing where there should be green and between us the recognition of an immense and wasted life. My second wife left me because I set our birds free. One yellow with crippled wing quickly going down and to the left, cat meat, cackling like an organ. And the other, mean green of empty thimble head popping up like a rocket high into the hollow sky, disappearing like sour love and yesterday's desire and leaving me forever. And when my wife returned that night, with her bags and plans, her tricks and shining greeds, she found me glittering over a yellow feather, seeking out the music which she oddly failed to hear. When Bukowski was aged 24, his short story, Aftermath of a Lengthy Rejection Slip, was published in Story magazine. Two years later, another short story, 20 Tanks from Castledown, 
was published by the Black Sun Press in issue three of Portfolio, an intercontinental quarterly, a limited run, loosely broadside collection printed in 1946 and edited by Carice Crosby. Failing to break into the literary world, Bukowski grew disillusioned with the publication process and quit writing for almost a decade, a time that he referred to as a 10-year drunk. These lost years formed the basis for his semi-autobiographical chronicles and there are fictionalized versions of Bukowski's life through his highly stylized alter ego, Henry Chanasky. In 1955, Bukowski was treated for a near-fatal bleeding ulcer. After leaving the hospital, he began to write poetry. That same year, he agreed to marry small-town Texas poet Barbara Fry, but they were subsequently divorced in 1958. According to Howard Stern's Charles Bukowski locked in the arms of a crazy life, she later died under mysterious circumstances in India. Following his divorce, Bukowski resumed drinking and continued writing poetry. Several of Bukowski's poems were published in the late 1950s in Gallows, a small poetry magazine published briefly by John Griffith. The small avant-garde literary magazine Nomad, published by Anthony Linick and Donald Factor, the son of Max Factor Jr., offered a home to Bukowski's early work. Nomad's inaugural issue in 1959 featured two of his poems. A year later, Nomad published one of Bukowski's best-known essays, Manifesto, a call for our own critics. By 1960, Bukowski had returned to the post office in Los Angeles and began work as a letter filing clerk, a position he held for more than a decade. In 1962, he was distraught over the death of Jane Cooney Baker, his first serious girlfriend. Bukowski turned his inner devastation into a series of poems and stories lamenting her death. For Jane, with all the love I had, which was not enough, I pick up the skirt, I pick up the sparkling beads in black, this thing that moved once around flesh, and I call God a liar. I say anything that moved like that or knew my name could never die in the common verity of dying. And I pick up her lovely dress, all her loveliness gone, and I speak to all the gods, Jewish gods, Christ gods, chips of blinking things, idols, pills, bread, fathoms, risks, knowledgeable surrender, rats in the gravy of two gone quite mad without a chance, hummingbird knowledge, hummingbird chance, I lean upon this, I lean on all of this and I know her dress upon my arm, but they will not give her back to me. Beginning in 1967, Bukowski wrote the column Notes of a Dirty Old Man for Los Angeles Open City, an underground newspaper. When Open City was shut down in 1969, the column was picked up by the Los Angeles Free Press as well as the hippie underground paper Nola Express in New Orleans. In 1969, Bukowski and Neely Cherkovsky launched their own short-lived mimeographed literary magazine, Laugh Literary and Man the Humping Guns. They produced three issues over the next two years. In 1964, a daughter, Marina Louise Bukowski, was born to Bukowski and his living girlfriend, Frances Smith. In 1969, Bukowski accepted an offer from Black Sparrow Press publisher John Martin and quit his post office job to dedicate himself to full-time writing. He was then 49 years old. As he explained in a letter at the time, I have one of two choices, stay in the post office and go crazy or stay out here and play at writer and starve. 
I have decided to starve. Less than one month after leaving the postal service, he finished his first novel, Post Office, as a measure of respect for Martin's financial support and faith in a relatively unknown writer, Bukowski published almost all of his subsequent major works with Black Sparrow Press, which became a highly successful enterprise. An avid supporter of small independent presses, Bukowski continued to submit poems and short stories to innumerable small publications throughout his career. Bukowski embarked on a series of love affairs and one-night trysts. One of these relationships was with Linda King, a sculptor and poet. Critic Robert Peters reported seeing Bukowski as an actor in King's play Only a Tenant, in which she and Bukowski stage read the first act at the Pasadena Museum of the Artist. This was a one-off performance of what was a shambolic work. Bukowski's other affairs were with a recording executive and a 23-year-old redhead. He wrote a book of poetry as a tribute to his love for the latter, titled Scarlet. His various affairs and relationships provided material for his stories and poems. Another important relationship was with Tanya, a pseudonym of Amber O'Neill, also a pseudonym, described in Bukowski's Women as a pen pal that evolved into a weekend tryst at Bukowski's residence in Los Angeles in the 1970s. Amber O'Neill later self-published a chap book about the affair entitled Blowing My Hero. In 1976... Bukowski met Linda Lee Bagel, a health food restaurant owner, rock and roll groupie, aspiring actress, heiress to a small Philadelphia mainline fortune, and devotee of Meher Baba. Two years later, he moved from the East Hollywood area where he had lived for most of his life to the harborside community of San Pedro, the southernmost district of Los Angeles. Bagel followed him and they lived together intermittently over the next two years. They were eventually married by Manly Palmer Hall, a Canadian-born author, mystic and spiritual teacher. In 1985... Bagel is referred to as Sarah in Bukowski's novels Women and Hollywood. In the 1980s, Bukowski collaborated with cartoonist Robert Crum on a series of comic books, with Bukowski supplying the writing and Crum providing the artwork. Through the 1990s, Crum also illustrated a number of Bukowski's stories, including the collection The Captain is Out to Lunch and the Sailors Have Taken Over the Ship, and the story Bring Me Your Love. Bukowski's live poetry readings were legendary, with the drunk, raucous crowd fighting with the drunk, angry poet. Shut up, you pack of dirty bastards. I'm Tonight to is going to be a very dignified reading. <laughs> I will not rejoin or have rejoinders with the audience. I shall read you dignified poetry in a dignified way. We shall comport ourselves as ladies and gentlemen of culture. Thank you. <laughs> Bukowski died of leukemia on March the 9th, 1994 in San Pedro, aged 73, shortly after completing his last novel, Pulp. The funeral rites orchestrated by his widow were conducted by Buddhist monks. He is interred at Green Hills Memorial Park in Rancho Palos Verdes. An account of the proceedings can be found in Gerald Lachlan's book, Charles Bukowski, A Sure Bet. His gravestone reads, 
Don't try, a phrase which Bukowski uses in one of his poems, advising aspiring writers and poets about inspiration and creativity. Bukowski explained the phrase in a 1963 letter to John William Corrington. Somebody at one of these places asked me, what do you do? How do you write, create? You don't, I told them. You don't try. That's very important not to try. Either for Cadillacs, creation or immortality. You wait, and if nothing happens, you wait some more. It's like a bug high on the wall. You wait for it to come to you. When it gets close enough, you reach out, slap out and kill it. Or, if you like its looks, you make a pet out of it. The old girl. She was very thin, grey, bent, and each day she waited at the door of the first interstate bank in San Pedro. And as the people came and went, she approached them one by one and asked for money. About 75% of the time, I respond to those who ask, but with the other 25%, I am instinctively put off and just don't have the will to give. The frail old woman at the bank put me off. She had put me off for some time and we had a silent understanding. I would lift my hand in a gesture of protest and she would turn quickly away. This had happened so often that now she remembers and doesn't approach me. One noon I sat in my car and watched her and after 20 attempts she scored 17 times. I drove off as she was approaching yet another soft touch and even so I suddenly felt real guilt for my unfeeling habit of refusing the old girl. Later in the clubhouse at Hollywood Park, between the sixth and seventh races, I saw her again and she was going up the aisle, frail and bent, a large wad of paper money clutched tight in a bony hand, clearly on her way to bet the next race. Of course she had every right to be there, to place her bets with the rest of us. She only wanted and needed what most people want and need, a chance. I watched as she reached the top of the aisle and I saw her stop and speak to a young man who smiled and then handed her a bill. Not to be distracted, I rose and went to the betting window to place my own wager. And going back to my seat, as I was walking down the aisle, she was coming up and we saw one another. And without thinking, I held my hand up, gently, in that familiar gesture she'd so often seen in front of the bank. She looked at me with unblinking blue eyes and said, Fuck you, as we passed on the stairs. She was right, of course. It's a matter of survival. General Motors does it, you do it, the cat does it, so does the bird. Nations do it, families do it, I do it. The boxer sometimes does it. It's done when you buy a loaf of bread. It's done sometimes out of madness and fear. It's done in the doctor's office and in the back alley. It's done everywhere, all the time, over and over again. We all want to survive. It's the inevitable way, the familiar way, the way things work. I went back to my seat to ponder all that, but I couldn't come up with anything useful at all. As the horses broke from the gate, hustled by the crouching jocks in their silks, orange, blue, yellow, shocking pink, green, chartreuse, a stampeding rainbow of controlled fury, the sun shot through the screaming and I suddenly knew that we were all caught forever in the self-same trap and I instantly forgave that old girl for belonging.